let's see how we go. So, um, hello and a very warm welcome to the Explain Pain in the Clinic. My name is Joanna and I am Director of Noi in Europe and I'm joined this morning by my very good friend and Noi instructor Tim Beams. Good morning or even good afternoon Tim. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim has been a Noi teacher for well over 15 years. He has taught literally hundreds of Explain Pain courses to thousands of clinicians all over the world. He is an active clinician himself working um, in complex and persistent pain and also founder of an organisation called La Pub Scientifique, uh, which is an online platform for clinicians to learn about pain directly from researchers and expert pain, pain clinicians. It's uh, They have a fantastic podcast. Uh, so, Tim, uh, if you wouldn't mind just dropping the link to that in the chat, sometimes people, we refer to things that people can then click out, click through to and have a, have a look at. Um, so these sessions are all about giving you a taste of explain pain and how to practically use these in use this in the clinic. Some of you will have already done an explain pain course. And so for those of you, these sessions are designed to reinforce what you've already learned. But if you are new to explain pain, this will give you a little taste of what we cover in the core courses. So just a couple of things to mention. Tim will be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of them as we can. If you want to watch the recording to the session, you can access it in the NOI clinical discussion group and in on our YouTube channel. So I'll drop the link to that in the chat in just a minute. Uh, today, we are talking about empowering self-management, patients as active partners in their pain recovery. So, uh, Tim, could you just give us a brief summary of what you're going to be talking about today, please? Um, OK, so self-management, why is it important? Um, and um, what we might be thinking about as healthcare professionals and, and, and maybe as a, as a, a patient as well um, in that process. Cool. OK, so um, kick off by having a look at why self-management is important in helping your patients in their recovery. So, yes, over to me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I, I think really simply said, you spend a very small amount of time with your patients or your clients um, relative to the amount of time they spend on their own or, or away from you. Um, so in the ideal world, we want to be powering up everything that they can do actively for themselves um, in the in uh, when when they're when they're with themselves. And there is a number of different things that we will be talking about in relation to pain um, that relate to more sort of specific and targeted approaches relating to the pain or lifestyle um, choices and, and decisions and habits as well. So um, it's absolutely imperative that uh, becoming um, more active in your own health is uh, um, key to, to recovery or key to you optimizing the your health as well. Okay, uh, I think, great. I think I was answering the question. <laughs> yeah, you were. Um, but so, so, so that it's important. I think we've established that. that and as a clinician, um, how how do you what, what what measures do you take to encourage your patients to become active participants to put them put them in the driving seat of their recovery? Um, well, I, can I say sort of the first thing is um, I think it's it's natural that when someone's seeking help from another, so if they're accessing me, then there is an element of them saying, uh, you know. Um, you, you know best you, you know and and uh, I'm in a position where I'm seeing a lot of my patients online so in that respect there's also, also a bias that you know they're going to have to take on board what we're talking about and and 
the sorts of ideas that we come up we're coming up with collaboratively it's not me dictating something based back on that person but there are times when someone needs a little bit more support or are more passive in that um, process um, and that's quite often the case when um, when you're meeting for the first time or, or, or you're new in your relationship where where there is a, a more for some people a more passive role some people are naturally a more proactive more active in their um, approach to health and, and well-being and, and what we see from a, a number of different measures is that we see if the more active someone can be in their approach the the better the outcomes essentially so i mean it really should be a, 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 a an important part of our work with someone is supporting them at the time if they need you to be sort of take a little bit more of the reins and and but also building the skills in order for them to be able to to run with it um on their own when and when they're ready yeah absolutely brilliant um so what i'm hearing here is that the more active they are uh sort of the better the outcomes probably definitely bottom line definitely yeah 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 okay so with that in mind um where do you start with this uh well, from a clinical point of view yeah i mean look the first place you start is when you're when you're talking to them and and you're building that narrative that understanding of of them um and you can ask really specific questions about what they do to help themselves or, or it comes out in that narrative um, and uh, some people are great advocates um, I mean if they've sought help then there is some sort of advocacy going on there whether or not they're doing it for themselves or someone else is doing it for them and then that should unravel um, um, very very quickly um, so so I, I yeah that would be a, a part of it and then and then there is sort of um you know if you want the idea of a sort of having ownership of your health and your well-being so if you are hearing within that narrative that someone is seeing many different varied clinicians um then it gives you a sense of you know how strong that ownership is that they have of their own health and, and well-being so we get a sense of it um in terms of what we're hearing what we listen to but we also get a sense of it from the questions that we're asking someone as well um, yeah really interesting so you're talking about um the way you're talking to somebody um moving and understanding what you think their exist what they come to you with in terms of their uh, understanding of how much responsibility they have to take how do you address it then if you've got if you if there's going to be degrees aren't there <laughs> on a big scale I guess of somebody that's really um, keen and wanting to be part of it right through somebody who just wants to be fixed yep. so um, sort of it does take a sort of midpoint there. Where would you go next after having got some sense of where they were on that scale? How can you then move them on? Yeah. Well, why don't we start a bit earlier? Because there, there, you know, there's, there's, if we're saying there's a need to create ownership of your health and well-being and be proactive. I mean, mindset comes into this in some respects as well, and and. Mm -hmm. You know one thing that derails that can be pain itself because it can be so disabling it can create massive suffering it can be quite there can be a lot of uncertainty around it and worry and fear etc so actually you know starting off and giving them the tools and the understanding is a key part of that mm. before they take ownership otherwise why would i take home these suggestions you know why am i going to problem solve for myself um so so it, you know, it does depend on that individual um, where you start. Um, so, so, so I, and 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 I'm thinking, I, I'm you were saying about taking responsibility, and there, there, I think a lot of people can either blame themselves 
or blame is attributed to them for not taking responsibility for themselves. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that as ever being helpful. You know, why, why, why look back and think, oh God, I wish I hadn't have done that because you did do that or you didn't do that. So, you know, why not just work with what you have now and let's be in the here and now. But as human beings, we love to sort of revisit memories, don't we go back to the there and then. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, yeah, coming back, sort of trying to try to um, make some sense out of this. Um, from an individual point of view, there, it, I think it's absolutely natural that some people um, require a little bit of, of support. Um, perhaps we take a little more ownership. Um, perhaps there are other people who, who can advocate for them as well, um, dependent on where they are in their journey. Because mm. because pain as one thing can can derail that, um, and there naturally are people, and I, you do hear it in your practice. You hear people like, so I I mean a question might be something along the lines of, um, can you tell me who who do you see that typically does well? Is there a type of person that does really well? And there is a type of person that does well, and um, you know broadly it is around mindset and being proactive but that doesn't mean to say if you're not proactive you won't ever do well but there but there is the sort of a more positive proactive mindset that means that that person is going to engage in um, in activities um, habits etc that naturally will be a part of that recovery and the health and the well-being approach mm, okay um do you are there, are there sort of, is there a, are there strategies then, sort of pr practical strategies that you use uh, to to help people along that journey of of mastering that, of becoming better at taking responsibility for their yeah. yeah, I I mean, like I I mean, I guess what we're really starting to talk about now are, are coaching strategies yeah um so so we've talked in the past about being you know instead of seeing ourselves as a fixer and some people will be you know if you are offering uh, an injection therapy or surgery etc you know there is a sort of mindset of being the fixer the one who does it for someone else but even then you're not doing it in isolation of that person in their life so having some guidance to know how to be in and around that moment and afterwards is important. Um, how we would position and how Explain Pain fits into this beautifully is that it's more positioned as that guide, the supporter, the facilitator in the, the process. And in order to be a facilitator, there needs to be a sort of collaborative um, approach, a relationship built that means that like we said, that might be a bit more, oh, I want to say power, but there might be a little bit more power given towards or waiting given towards the decisions for one person rather than another at different times or, or dependent on what you're talking about. So if you have um, specialist knowledge in a particular area, it makes total sense that someone is saying, I'm going to you for your specialist knowledge. So, so you know, the weight, the power is slightly you know a portion towards towards you as the professional but the hope would be as facilitator that you are guiding and supporting and growing someone's ability to be that advocate for themselves and to, to have the knowledge necessarily and necessary for them to 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 then take themselves on that journey we had that um we have a sort of um analogy don't we of the of being the driver in your own recovery Mm. but to be the driver in your own recovery you might have been a passenger to begin with and you might have been in the back seat as a passenger to begin with but at some point i mean as, as you know when you're learning to drive um you at some point you need to do it yourself mm. <laughs> you've got to get in the car you've got to do it and as a result of you doing it you're going to grow from that the doing it is important because then we learn about what goes well uh it, we learn about what doesn't go so well and then that shapes our actions into the future got you there's a um so that's interesting because that leads very nicely onto this question well from kath 
um, that there are people who are great at being good for themselves, but as patients are weary, a little bit of ease, uh, but so we're giving a, a little bit of ease of the driving seat. Can that be enough to let them remember their strength? So that that sort of I think that that ties into what you were just saying in that sometimes they start in the back seat and then maybe they come to the passenger seat and then they actually start to take control of it. Um, yeah, and, and, and sometimes you need, I mean, if we're carrying on that analogy, you, you know, they might have a, a, a period of time in the driving seat and then you just swap over. And um, so, and but but that's that's mm. that transitioning from more from, from a more passive to a more active role in their, um, recovery so towards that self-management um, not everybody's there to start with um, but and there's some lovely papers written about this but that role of being passive doesn't mean to say that there needs to be this paternalistic perspective where someone is saying you must do this treatment you can still involve you you know and i think you should it necessarily should be a discussion it should be about the a joint decision making even when in essence if we're talking about maybe the word wasn't right power but even if you have the specialist knowledge in a particular area there you know you are still talking about them and they have the specialist knowledge in themselves and their experiences of what they've tried for themselves because everybody will have tried stuff they mm -hmm. won't have come to you having not tried stuff people cycle through the sort of known um uh, exercises the known techniques and known medication whatever it is that they've tried in the past or they've been asked to do or they've found on when they've searched google or whatever they'll, they'll have tried things um, so we can bring that knowledge into that decision making process as well which is the really the key then as a coach and a facilitator is it is then bringing the best out of that knowledge and that understanding uh, that may require some careful questioning. Mm. Um, it might require that you you know, just place in some doubt in their knowledge if you think that what they've been doing isn't that helpful, um, or the suggestion is from the evidence it's not that helpful. So, so there is a sort of skill in um, how you go about that as well. Um, yeah, you know, I find that be, really fascinating. You can be a bit kinder, can't you? You can be quite compassionate about it or you can sort of, you know, really sort of put down that fax and slam it on the table mm. um, because because and that that's the artistry in in what we're talking about is is you you have a feel of how you work with someone. Mm. I do find the that when you start going into the coaching mode of sort of you're trying to extract the information but then get them to see the information for themselves get them to sort of have these mo these um aha moments and moments of realization um do you want to go into that a bit more about how you yeah. might actually you know the kind of questioning that you know yeah i i mean look you can be more open and say um have you got any thoughts about what you could do let's say um or you could you sometimes they just need a little bit more directing so, so sort of a directive question you've told me about da, 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 how mm. this exercise or this treatment or the time that you've spent with this other clinician or, or whatever that might be and can you tell me do you feel that that's an effective tool for us to use in the future and, and why might that be so you can be a little bit more you know let's just be very direct or you can be quite open um and again you can and again there's sort of sort of the questioning if you're trying to sort of bring it front of center of, of realization about how they've done you can be a bit more closed with your questioning um although a coaching technique would be slightly preferenced towards having a, an open dialogue and an open question um, but not everybody is in a place to be able to do to, to, to do that as well. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. What about um, so? What about um, I might be jumping the gun here, and if I am, just tell me. We'll go back. But a, a sort of feedback loop 
um, how important is that in in this process of somebody understanding what is working for them and you know do you actually use practical things for people to log things like that or um that's yeah that's an interesting question <clears throat> i like the way that you've used the feedback loop because I mean, something that we would be talking about uh, and, and and sort of is is a sort of key thing for me is talking about it is is one thing. Doing it is the power. Yeah. And we need to then get some feedback if we're using that terminology about how well the actions, you know, what 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 happened with those actions as well. So um, and we got we we get lots of information from that. I mean, we get information about whether or not someone thought it was actionable and, and they're willing to do it again. Mm. How easy was it? How simple was it? How, how known, you know, was it known enough? Did they understand it so that they would engage in that again? But we, and then we get some feedback about, um, uh, about whether it was tailored in to the individual, you know, whether it was specific enough for that individual or whether that needs a bit of tweaking. And we've talked to, in the past about, uh, I, I'm not keen on the, on the phrase trial and error. I, and I'm thinking of, about uh, um, growth through action. So, so you do something and then you, grow, you always get knowledge and understanding from the actions that you take. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that and come back to that, what you talked about is that, that feedback, that feedback then shapes whether or not someone takes action, what that action looks like into the future. Yeah. Including whether you are part of that actionable plan as well, because, yeah. <laughs> because at some point someone is going to say, I don't need you anymore, or you're not right for me. And, um, and, and like, that's okay. Like <laughs> That's, that's, yeah. sometimes it can hurt <laughs> especially if you thought you were doing a great job but but you, you know that's a part of them being um an advocate for themselves as well yeah i mean that's success isn't it if they don't need you anymore yeah 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 yeah. i mean ultimately that should be wonderful shouldn't it is saying you've got the skills and knowledge the know-how the confidence to go it alone awesome i'm here if you need me touch base i love it um I have a few people that I've worked with over the years where we have the relationship where they can check in with me and um, and say, hi, Tim, I thought I'd just drop you a line and say I'm doing great or whatever, you know, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful thing to hear. Um, and that that in turn, and this is slightly off tangent, but that in turn shapes my knowledge and my thinking and my problem solving is to know what is, you know, what uh, should I expect from someone who does go it alone a year down the line? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think actually that brings us on, thanks to a really nice question um, from Kath. And she says, um, it's not right for this webinar perhaps, but can you at some point remind me where I can go and read, listen, etc., to understand better the nuances of what recovery means in these contexts? No need to apologize. I think that's actually a really logical, place to sort of draw this to a close so um what what does recovery look like i think that that was in the title of the webinar as well wasn't <laughs> it uh, um yeah in in pain recovery wasn't it patients as active partners well I, I think recovery um is shaped over and what someone thinks recovery is is shaped through the process through that journey so a typical thing that you hear to begin with is if you were to say what would recovery look like uh, if everything goes well it would it might th be things like i'll be pain free mm. what you tend to see and hear is that uh recovery and cass being you know she's got that uh, she even used the word nuance so there's a nuance uh, to, to what recovery means that is contextual so Kath you obviously I think you know a lot more than the question is saying but but recovery might be I'm noticing that I can play with my children my mood is better I feel like I'm have more energy through the day or the week or when I'm at work I can concentrate and focus or you know so actually what someone experiences as recovery it cannot be very different from what 
when they first come to see you, what they mm -hmm. think recovery will be. And what we know about recovery is that recovery doesn't always have to feel like, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, the measurable reduction in pain, which it, it may, it may include and and recovery often includes a, a reduction and and complete re resolution of pain but but that that isn't always what people are saying as well when they recover um and that ain't the ability to engage in life and and feel more like myself or or engage in relations with other people or whatever that might be it is often what the sort of tangible felt sense that I have recovered will be. Um, mm. I, I'm liking this to sort of life shrinking when you're in pain and us limiting it and there being constraints there and growth and possibilities and opportunities are the words that I often use. So yeah. we start to create more possibility for work or doing some activity or socializing or whatever and then by bringing in those opportunities then that creates the sense of growth and enrichment in myself as well mm. um, yeah that's yeah i like that i like that answer a lot have you got any suggestions from um for kath for reading anything on that subject I keep thinking of Bronnie Thompson. She talks a lot about um, this, doesn't she? Because she talks about living well with pain. Living well with pain. Yeah. I mean, Bronnie's a great person to listen to, actually. Um, yeah. Check um, out the podcast. I don't know if you're. I don't know if you're a follower, but there's some. She's done. So she's done a podcast for the pub, hasn't she? And there's also some sort of there's some social media stuff around living well with pain and. There, there, there is and from a literature sort of research point of view Lorimer's latest um work around recovery is is an interesting place to 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 go as well so what i think he would say is we need to start lifting our expectations and lifting expectations of our patients um because actually the the research backs up that that treatment done well will be successful and and success will be measured i mean it depends in research how they measure it you'll have a primary and then you have your secondary measures and primary measures might be a pain a change in pain and secondary measures might be someone's ability to be able to navigate life differently or or, or, or it, it really then depends on how someone's framed that question mm yeah cool okay thanks. And, re and research isn't always what we do in the clinic <laughs> you know I mean, it might be it might influence the direction but but um yeah if i'm only asking about pain if someone's telling me about pain i'm asking them about them um which probably then comes back around the feedback loop joe to to the self-management is it's all about them yeah i couldn't agree more and that actually brings us right back to some of the comments that people made right at the beginning, which was that you can't do it for your uh, clients. Lorimer said at the conference that it isn't the client's fault that they have this problem, but they do have to take some responsibility to change. I think that, thank you for that, Carol. That brings us right back around in a, a really concise way. So thank you. Um, thank you, Tim. And thank you to everybody who did manage to find um, the link to join today. I apologise for the mess up this morning. Uh, these things do happen sometimes, unfortunately. But uh, we will be back again shortly. <laughs> and it's great to be back, I have to say. I do miss doing these uh, lives with Tim. So uh, thanks for joining live. And uh, again, the recording will be in on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, Tim has a uh, course coming up in London, if anybody's interested in attending, that is on the 12th and 13th of October. We only do sort of one of these a year now face to face. So this is a bit of a treat. Um, and if anybody is interested in joining, then we'll be sending the link out to join that course too. So if you fancy spending two days in London with Tim, uh, doing a lot more of this, but face to face. <laughs> not on a the screen then um please do come along i'll send the links out 
Anyway, thanks again, folks, for joining, and um, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Take care. Bye. See you.